Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, July 28th, 2022, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Hello, hello, dear friends and podcast listeners. Welcome to the show this week. I am Norm and joined by my co-host, Kishore. Hari Kishore, good to see you. Good to see you as well. It's official. It's officially con season. I think at this point, we can just say it. Uh, my feed is uh, uh, 25% the world is going to end. Uh, 25% uh, <laughs> I, I'm mad at some sports situation yes but 50 percent people in cosplay and hype hype oh i'm all about the sizzle I, the steak is good too but i love this that sizzle and i am back from comic-con that's why we didn't have a, a show last week because it was a whirlwind day of travel and post-processing and videos getting stuff up but we are back and that's going to be basically the vast majority of the the show this week. I'm recapping uh, what we saw at Comic Con and uh, what we saw come out of Comic Con, even though we weren't there for most of it, as well as uh, well, we will have some VR to discuss toward the end because some major VR news did drop uh, today uh, as we're recording this early in the week. Uh, but first of all, sure, what was your Comic Con experience like uh, watching everything from afar? I was, you know, basically just watching via. Twitter. Um, I did kind of uh, tune into a few uh, shaky cam footage on YouTube. <laughs> uh, takes. Yes. I couldn't resist. Um, but I honestly, I tried to avoid the hype train um, uh, too much. I was really just interested in some uh, seeing a couple trailers, uh, seeing uh, some, usually there's some interesting toys and collectible exclusives that uh, that dropped during Comic Con, and I was kind of tracking some of those. And then, even though San Diego is not a great cosplay convention, I, you know, there's usually a few, um, you know, great pictures and uh, activations, if I want to speak the lingo, uh, that people usually uh, talk about. So I was just sort of kind of keeping tabs on social media. I did not feel like i missed out this year though uh i'll be honest mm. like the idea of the claustrophobic work my way through the exhibit floor was not i was not sort of up for that uh quite yet um i think san diego is not your starter con it is something you work your way up to uh so i'm just curious what the experience was because you went down on thursday yeah, we're down just for a day. It's maybe our shortest Comic Con yet. I gotta continue to streak. I've been to every Comic Con for the past, you know, sixteen. I don't know, what was my first Comic Con? It's two thousand five. Yeah, seventeen years minus the two years they didn't actually have in San Diego. Uh, they did the Comic Con at home in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty one. Last no Thanksgiving, I don't count the Thanksgiving fall comic-con test the waters event as a real comic-con uh but had to make it down there joey and i flew down no adam so no incognito we didn't have any big event uh or or big meetups or anything so it was really just to catch up film some videos uh, walk the floor a little bit and get a sense of like what that new big convention energy was and the appetite was absolutely there people like lots of people thursday is never a cosplay day friday you start to see more cosplay saturday is the big cosplay day so mm -hmm. miss all that on the floor but it was as full exhibitor wise as it's ever been certainly a little bit you know, weird in terms of like no, no, some of the big booths weren't there. No big DC Warner Brothers booth. That being gone, massive. Uh, Marvel was there. No big Weta booth. So like a lot of the sense memory, the spatial awareness that I know, you know, that layout of San Diego Convention Center, like the back of my hand, all the ins and outs where I'm going to see X, Y, and Z people. Like it felt like a little bit like a, a different universe of Comic-Con, a multiverse, if you will. Uh, you know, Joey actually had the best example. He said it was like in Avengers Endgame when Cap, Tony, and Ant-Man and Hulk go back in time to Avengers 2012 in New York where they're like, this is very familiar. But we can't change. We can't interact too much. It's Everything's kind of weird and different. It felt a little bit like that, a Comic-Con out of time. Uh, so 
even though the main bit of Comic-Con felt like a throwback to how it was, um, you know, part of Comic-Con is like the footprint of Comic-Con kept on growing and growing and growing. They're taking yeah. over, you know, Petco Park and all of the gas lamp would like every single bar and restaurant would have something. It, are, are we still seeing that or has that, oh, it shrunk away? It's absolutely sure. It's still present in some sense, like Star Trek Paramount had a big the. uh 10 Ford bar, Star Trek experience down in the main gas up area. But, you know, we're, we're, if you don't know the geography of San Diego, the San Diego Convention Center is massive because it's along the harbor. It long, so one side of it, the back side is, is water. Uh, it's uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, eight halls of space, all one interconnected space. And the building curves. So I used to tell people if you stand in hall A and you look, down the long ways of Comic Con, you could never see the end because actually it folds, it bends. It's like a you see the curvature of the con uh, is how is how big it is. Um, so it, it absolutely takes over that part of the district. Gas Lamp is the the food and dining and and um, dancing district, but you didn't have like along the train tracks like like there the big buildups, like, you know, big exhibits or recreations of Ninja Warrior to, you know, in past years, they would have the actual, the good place like TBS and FX and all those big things like zombie runs. You didn't have that this year. So definitely it, it didn't feel as occupied as in the past. And it certainly wasn't as shoulder to shoulder on the convention floor. They didn't space out the tables or the booths or anything, but it was still you know, tens of thousands of people. I don't know the total count, you know, probably over a hundred thousand people over the course of the weekend. And like I said, every booth was filled. So, you know, it was in full force. It just was a little more subdued. All right. So give me your highlights from the show floor before we oh get into gosh. the panels. Yeah. So on the floor, I think the, the winner, the best in show has to be uh, the Garner Hall EFX animatronic Grogu that went viral. We knew this was coming up. We got a little head bit of heads up from uh, from EFX uh, head of the show that we had to check out their booth. And even preview night, Wednesday night, this was going viral on social media. This is their $100,000 bespoke custom made animatronic Grogu using the same castings, cut and sew cloth, paint pattern as the Grogu puppet that Legacy Effects made for the Mandalorian. But in the pram, he's seated. He has uh, anywhere from 15 to 32 servos. This model had 15. They have a 32 servo version that just gives it full of animation and, and personality and life. So uh, a like theme park animatronic, essentially. Eyes moving around, ears down. Uh, the uh, uh, higher end version of the head prototype you know, can even grab uh, the, the the Razor Crest knob the, and, and go and move it from hand to hand. So a little bit of a special effect there. And this was like just, it wasn't behind glass, just behind stanchions, right in the corner of a highly trafficked area. And crowds were there the entire day. And it was running and the, the animatronics engineers were running, running animation cycles uh, and people were just getting pictures of it all day long. So it, it was the thing to see, I think. Uh, so I'm not ready for the word bespoke to hit <laughs> the descriptors for for collectibles like this. Oh, you're, you don't wanna, a, you're, you're not in on the twenty five million dollar uh, Infinity Gauntlet with real gems no. <laughs> that Marvel trotted out. <laughs> I'm not. I'm really I'm really not. Um, I am impressed with the the mechanics of this uh, this Grogu more than anything else. Um, I. It, and it really is like almost operates as like a museum piece more so yeah. than it than an actual device that a thing that people will purchase like all of these things are. I'm sure um, in, you know, six to 12 months, we're going to see miniaturized versions of this that are going to be at more affordable price points, like a two thousand dollar <laughs> animated Grogu is going to come out and people are like, ah, and that and that's going to be the thing. Um, the video is great. If you haven't checked it out, I encourage people to, to watch it. You get kind of a pretty close, up close uh, peek uh, behind the uh, the item. And also, it's convergence of past tested storytelling. You know, you know, because we had done interviews with Brian Ono at EFX, and they have the helmets. And yes, I know they've had issues in the past with uh, fulfillment. You know, and a lot of people with pre-orders, it's a 
ongoing thing with all these licensees and and their production. Uh, but Garner Holt, who did the animatronics, Garner Holt Productions, you know, they were part of the tested live show. Garner Holt himself, mm-hmm. he presented a video of their um, the uh, Abraham Lincoln animatronic that also went viral years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so a complimentary video piece to watch if you've watched if you like uh, animatronics. Uh, also on the show floor, God, what were the other big highlights? You know, uh, taking over a lot of the uh, booth space was uh, Bandai. So Bandai is just massive. Like they were the big sponsor over New York Comic Con as well last year because they have, you know, Gundam, they have the Star Wars stuff, they have Dragon Ball, they have all the, it's a, mm-hmm. it's a massive company for collectibles, for model making, and um, they were just like, they didn't have one singular booth. But they had a lot of different booths. So it was really cool to see some of the new uh, some movie, the movie realization pieces, as well as some Gundam sets. Um, they didn't have like a place for people to build Gundam, which I really was hoping for because I always love chatting with the Gunpla builders. Um, and what was the other? And Hasbro, you know, Hasbro, Mattel, the two big toy companies. Uh, we don't know Mattel as well, but they had like the Jurassic world stuff but hasbro has you know transformers gi joe and uh star wars so seeing the six mm-hmm. uh, six scale or a six uh sorry the uh 12 scale six inch black series stuff from star wars as well as i i did a video which you'll be able to see soon of their selfie series uh personalized 3d printed uh, action figures which again convergence of uh past tested storytelling with uh 3d printing and form labs being their production partner and of course hasbro and their action figures um other big highlights uh, i also got to try uh the nerf you see this nerf announced um the next next nerf thing which isn't darts it's not foam balls but it's the gel tablets the gel balls how many uh, of those gel balls could it shoot? It was It's like a paintball gun almost in terms yeah. of how rapid fire it was. They're moving, inching toward paintball. It's like definitely like as people age out of foam darts and age out of the rival, which I love the rival system. Those rival foam is balls. great. Love that, right? They're, you can, mm-hmm. you, they still hurt if you like go point blank. You don't want to aim it. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to be caution uh cautious and they get everywhere but like they you can you know adam made his thousand rival ball nerf blaster a couple years ago but i think they're looking to you know kids who are kids right teenagers who are aging out of that and want something between that and paintball uh this fires at a max rate of i believe 10 pellets per second and they're consumable meaning not you're not supposed to eat them even though they're non-toxic meaning you use them up so they're this, like you've seen like those gel toys, the inflatable. Yeah. Like all the kids have them. They 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 constitute with water. They come dehydrated. Uh, they expand in size. This is about a couple millimeters in diameter, but they give you ten thousand, and a full battery can run through. Uh, you know, five five or six thousand or so. So they're gonna want you to keep on buying them. And I would not want to do this indoors. Definitely a outdoor play. Um, outdoor play and, and i don't think they're biodegradable as any of the, most of these plastics are they you know they are non-toxic but they they will they'll stick around i think <laughs> yeah uh so but that was you know that was really neat to try uh you had the big sideshow booth of course the statue gallery as i like to call it so it didn't get as much as much time as i wanted there it was a whirlwind day like we flew in got to the convention at 11 o'clock went straight to filming and we were out of there for make our flight at 4 p.m so Ideally, I would have had you know another day to walk around and say hi to the artists that we wanted to say mm-hmm. hi to. David Peterson was there Friday through Sunday. Daniel Danger, Kevin Tong, Mondo, obviously there with a big Funko booth. Now they're owned by Funko, uh, but you know, it, it, it. I was energized just being on the floor. I was like, oh, I'm back at Comic Con, and it felt like a Comic Con not just because of the floor and the booth, but all the panels and the hype that emerged from them. So let's delve into that a little bit. Because Where do you want to start? Because uh, there were so many different um, big panels and announcements that emerged. Yeah, it's really fun actually observing the rest of Comic-Con at home because, uh, as I say, when you're on the floor, you don't know what's going on in the panels. Like, you're getting terrible internet, you don't want your phone to die, so you're just kind of taking in the floor. So you have to go back to your hotel room 
and then catch up. So actually to be able to watch some of the live streams that were there and the, the, uh, the live blogs, uh, that was really cool to, to do that. Um, and there's a, like a escalation of content, right? So they always have like the smaller studios on Thursday, Friday, the TV stuff is TV days, Friday, and then mm-hmm. Saturday you have the hall H panels, like ballroom 20 and hall H. Um, before we get to Saturday, what they had on the TV days, they had Lord of the Rings was one of the big sponsors, Amazon Prime, right? The boys wasn't there, but they had a panel on the big Rings of Power show coming out in September. Um, they had 20 cast members on stage, huge multimedia presentation, a big Comic-Con exclusive trailer they put out online afterward. And it really felt like this is 20 years after you know, 20 years after Lord of the Rings, we're returning back to Middle Earth. You have some familiar names, although not faces, but you have Elrond, you have Gladriel, and it is Sauron, right? Name dropping Sauron. You got dwarves, you got humans, you got elves, and you got big special effects. It, lo- it looked great. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm super pumped for the show. I, uh, The money was on the screen during yeah. that trailer. That trailer, uh, I thought, looked pretty fantastic. And um, frankly, I... Uh, it, it, I was a little skeptical of this series when Amazon first announced it and how much money that it was going to cost and, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, every bit that I keep seeing shows that they are giving uh, time and space to the characters and that they seem to be um, really pulling from the source material for it. You know, and I care a little bit less about that. I know that, you know, there are the diehard Tolkien fans who are like, oh, no, this age, this doesn't happen in this. And like, I think this primarily is going to be for a little more of a mass market audience and their target fan base. Yes, they want to cater to Tolkien fans and high fantasy fans, but it's going to be people who love the Lord of the Rings series, the movies. And while it's not a direct, you know, prequel to that in terms of the same production company and the same storytellers, it aesthetically looks of that world of the peter jackson lord of the rings world and so it that's it's a type of show where you can contrast it with like a science fiction show whether it's star trek or star wars and i don't know if they did this on on a volume style virtual production environment i'm sure we're gonna get those stories about how they film this but lord of the rings is always a series has benefited from location filming you know, being filming in New Zealand and parts, beautiful parts of the world that can simulate parts of Middle Earth and then having a hybrid of that plus then special effects and practical makeup effects. And this has all that in spades. Mm-hmm. Um, you also had on the Netflix side, Sandman, The Sandman, the Neil Gaiman live action. This is this is the thing that might get you back on Netflix, Kishore. I think so. I'm still kind of skeptical of it because so many different, um, attempts have been made to realize the Sandman outside of uh, the graphic novelization. And uh, I think they have not been successful by and large. Trailer looked pretty good. I, I think like I I thought the, you know, what we saw of Dream, like the, the main character, I yeah. thought that looked compelling and good. There's, uh, I, I think this is going to be driven by all the characters around dream. And I, I'm not sure I got enough of a picture to be like, yes, I'm all in dream traverses so many different like worlds and timelines and stuff like that too. Um, that, uh, I, I feel like I need to do like the frame by frame digestion of that trailer to, to be on board. Yeah. I will say Gwendolyn Christie's, uh, look Lucifer. Not- oh, I, I loved it. I love. So, Okay. Um, My takeaway from this is Neil Gaiman is heavily involved. Like he basically yeah. approved the casting of every one of these characters. And this is not a Zack Snyder-like frame-by-frame, panel-to-screen recreation. And I don't think you could do that because so much of the original Sandman graphic novels is tied to the artists that Neil Gaiman worked mm-hmm. with. You know, your your Kelly Jones and and uh, and, and it's so much of and, and the fantastical stuff that doesn't I don't think translates. Like Alan Moore has a point, you know. And, and Dylan Gaiman I think is also of that camp of like what's on the page stands on its own. But he's open to adaptation, and you know, from the Audible series being a, a form of adaptation of the Sandman to now the Netflix series being a form of adaptation, you know, doing twists on 
Constantine doing twists on you know uh, d- and, and having a more diverse cast for death for for Lucifer I think it's going to be on the actors to capture the essence of what readers took out of the Sandman and uh for Neil to sound as excited as he is on social media about the show gives me a lot of hope and faith for this um and there is a BBC-ish vibe that I think is very appropriate to this production. I don't know what it is, but there is, I don't know if you felt it too, but there, it felt like a British made show. I like, I think I know what you mean in the like kind of doctor who esque Yes. Kind of, yes. um, uh, vibes it gave off. I, I like, I love Neil Gaiman. He's also on the payroll for this. So I think you can't take his commentary on social media, his, his hype for it. Um, I- uh, well, you he's know, on without the payroll, some he, skepticism, it's his legacy too. Like this is his baby. Like he yeah. can be on the payroll. This but is like, the Neil Gaiman story. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, outside of that, for TV, you know, I, there was a panel uh, for House of the Dragon, but I think that would kind of fizzled a little bit. Like people, I think Lord of the Rings overshadowed that, um, and HBO did not have as strong a presence. Like there was no, you know, Peacemaker for example, season two. Um, So a little bit squandered opportunity there, I think. I think there was a lot of my friends that kept going back and forth, like, am I ready to be hurt by this show again? Like, that's (laughs) what their take on House of Dragon was. That it looked perfectly fine, but just not having a lot of faith um, in what's going on behind the scenes. Well, I got faith of the heart because Star Trek was also massively present at Comic-Con with a big Star Trek panel and peripheral panels for their video games. And this, like the the current crop of actors in Star Trek now, right now, just feel like they're having so much fun being in Star Trek, which I love. It feels like the nineties when we had like, you know, three Star Trek families ongoing with next generation ds9 and voyager and you know next gen movies and ds9 and voyager and tv uh right now with discovery with um uh strange new worlds lower decks and with uh picard and uh while we did get uh some picard uh, probably picard was the big thing right like mm-hmm. we had the big reveal of the original tng cast and some clues as to where those characters are in, in their lives 30 years later uh, for this final season that they've already shot of Star Trek Picard. What stuck out, what stuck out to you? Worf's look. Uh. <laughs> like all day long. And like, what um, uh, what was the weapon? He had like a different kind of weapon in that uh, trailer too. Like some sort of swordy looking thing that wasn't quite like a batleth. It was very different. So I think the production designer tweeted out that that is a new design that was designed by the original designer of the Batleth. So it has direct roots to the Batleth. Uh, I'm sure we'll ha- find out. He's Worf's got to gut someone, but he's in Starfleet. Like even though yeah. he's House of Martok and he left off and in, in this nine, you know, on on Kronos, uh, trying to re- stabilize the Klingon Empire, he's back in Starfleet. So Very I- interesting. Yeah. Totally interesting. I also thought they nailed his look more so than any of the other characters. Most of the other characters, because they're human, look like they're actors who have aged um, and are trying to stay in acting in some way. Um, But they just made Worf like age kind of gracefully as a Klingon. And I so I thought his look was perfect. Yeah, Michael Jordan obviously is a little thinner now than he was back then, but the the gray hair really works for him, and you know the mm-hmm. prosthetics have improved, and he, he's like he exuded the series. I could hear him just mm-hmm. in that little vignette that they had. Uh, Jordy, you had a little bit of uh, development of our Burton as Jordy, no visor of course, but he still has the cybernetics in his eyes, so you know he lost what he got back in insurrection and its eyes coming back uh but he's a father now and uh, that absolutely must be taken from lavar burton's own personal life and wanting that to be part of jordy's life mm-hmm. um you have beverly crusher you had you know of course we had saw Riker and troy uh in season one of picard but you did not have data you didn't have you didn't have brent spiner i i mean well Brent Spiner has been a central character of the first <laughs> yeah, two yeah. seasons, so kind of understand. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I just want to say about uh, Crusher, uh, Gates McFan really was effusive about her character storyline in this mm. in this season. And I think she said, I'm paraphrasing here, this is the like most uh, impactful and emotional story time line that Beverly Crusher ever, ever had. And you're, I was like, oh, OK, that's like a that's a sentence. And uh, so that kind of got my attention a little bit um, that these characters aren't just going to come in and be ancillary to the story, but they actually might be central to the story in some way. Uh, because I think it would be very easy to just cameo in the TNG characters and to, and just call it, call it a day. Um, so I, I still am tempering my expectations because you know what? I watched the first two seasons of Picard, um, but it was really delightful seeing them all on stage together. They've been on stage plenty of times together in other places. Um, but in the context of how they reveal these characters, they all seem like genuinely excited about it. I, I think they absolutely are. And it's a proper revisiting. I think they'll kind of the, what we wanted actually out of when they first announced Picard as a show and how gracious they are, of course, to the new crop of, uh, of Star Trek actors and who, who are now in the Star Trek family. Uh, unlike William Shatner, unlike William Shatner, of course. <laughs> uh, but the other Star Trek kind of surprise that we had, because I think it probably it's no surprise that we all love Strange New Worlds. And I think Lower Decks is, I, I'm telling you, it's some of the best Star Trek, most fun, self-aware Star Trek that's uh, that's going on. Uh, but a big surprise is they're leaning into both of those with a crossover episode in the next season of Strange New Worlds. So not next season of Lower Decks, but next season of Strange New Worlds, there's going to be a hybrid episode where it's not very clear whether they're going to have the two leads of uh, Lower Decks um, appear as animated characters or it's going to be both. I, I don't know what's going on here. They're also different time time periods. I think they can't do this like Simpsons-esque, like traversing different worlds kind of thing when like Homer went 3D. They can't do yeah. that kind of stuff. They got to just cast them as real people and have them be uh, involved and just go, go on from there. I, I think it's a testament to the two actors, um, Meritor and Boimler, the character, Jack Quaid, who from The Boys, he plays Boimler, and um, Tawny Newsom plays uh, uh, Beckett, Mariner. Um, and, you know, I think they could, in live action, capture the essence of, and, you know, put some Starfleet uniforms on them, do a little makeup, and they absolutely, I think, could, uh, as actors, portray their animated counterparts in live action um, but the story of uh, will be like a ds9 troubles episode like why are they in the strange new world's time period that's gonna be really funny and interesting yeah and and strange new worlds no no has no fear of the tongue-in-cheek of, of hijinks um, so i think very appropriate um okay dc we'll go through it rather quickly because there's really nothing nothing the it, biggest story was it was disappointing <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Shazam trailer looked fine. Um, Fury of the Gods, you got Helen Mirren and uh, Lucy, Lucy Liu uh, as their main protagonist. Um, it has a lot of the same vibes as the first Sh Shazam film. Uh, no hint of Black Adam in this film. Um, you know, no hint of a larger universe. Um, you know, there's lots of jokes during the panel about who would win in a fight between Shazam and Superman. It was a running gag. It was fine. Black Adam comes on this movie. It, like the rock has a so, like Dwayne Johnson has pushed this movie across the finish line. And so there was a little bit more energy because uh, he came out in costume. Uh, you know, he, you could see he was this uh, film means a lot to him. Again, the whole hype around this was that Henry Cavill was going to be there a, and a DC was going to make an announcement about it. Didn't happen. No mention of the Flash because of Ezra Miller's shenanigans. Um, no mention of Aquaman. I was a little surprised by that. I think that's, that's right. an Amber Heard thing. Yeah, that's why they're staying away from that. So it was just those two movies, and so it felt bare. Yeah, and and again, no peacemaking, no HBO Max. If they're pushing all the yeah. streaming stuff, and we're going to talk about Marvel and Disney Plus, but they've had success on HBO Max with 
uh, what they've announced so far. There's going to be, you know, the GCPD show that they, what they had in development, the, the, the Batman, right? And they're talking about the Penguin show that it's being worked on right now. But Blue Beetle, Batgirl, and Peacemaker are like opportunities for huge amounts of uh, DC excitement. And none of that was there. What a yeah. missed opportunity, even outside the overhyped Henry Cavill, Henry Cavill, you know, no show, which that's not their fault. You know, whoever made that rumor and, you know, deadline reporting on the rumor, but not confirming it, that didn't help. Like that just kind of set the whole thing up for, for failure um, if it wasn't in place. And, and it, it was, it was the, the elephant in the room, the, the lack of Superman. And that's why it was brought up in all those Q and A's. Yeah. Uh, but what didn't up at this point and what probably felt like the most comic con thing of all comic cons was a return of the Marvel hall H panel. The last time Kevin Feige on stage was to announce basically the phase four, which we are now almost done with. And here, he, along with select cast members from some of the movies and shows, were there to unveil Phase 5 and 6. Oh, my God. Okay, how should we go through this? Should we go to chronologically in I, terms of release date? I think we should leave Black Panther for the end, even though that's okay. not chronologically. Um, and, and we can talk. I mean, Phase 4, we'll just wrap that up real quick. It's She-Hulk and then Bla Black Panther movie. We'll come back to Black Panther. Um, I thought the She-Hulk um, uh, uh, trailer that they dropped looked better than the much last better. One. Oh gosh, much better. They were calling it their first thirty-minute sitcom, you know, and it has the Hulk. There's the comedy, the CG effects look much better, uh, and cameos are plenty. You know, and it's so we're gonna jump into some of the spoilers and spoilers meaning things they showed and on stage and talked about. So if you want to go in cold and don't want to watch trailers, we'll see you next time. But the She-Hulk trailer ended with daredevil daredevil in a red and yellow costume stylistically still similar to what he was wearing for the netflix show but different colorway and this kind of is daredevil's the beginning of daredevil's reemergence in the mcu it makes sense lawyers yeah. mcu tv show great um It'd be great it if they just get out lo like law briefs and just start working <laughs> yes. on them in oh costume on top of the building uh, yeah yeah uh fourth wall breaking so a little bit of Deadpooling, and they said heavily inspired by Fleabag, which you absolutely got that vibe, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. the the self-deprecating humor. Yeah, I mean, I still see it as more of an Ally McBeal than Fleabag type. It, it's going to have to earn a lot of irreverence to be become Fleabag, um, and it the trailer really plays it more lighthearted than anything yeah. else. Yeah. Wong, of course, Abomination. So Wong, again, the the, the through line for all Phase 4 uh, in his appearances. And this is a show that drops in less than a month, so August 17th. So we're going to get it real soon. Good luck to those CG artists wrapping up the episodes right now. Okay, we're skipping over Black Panther trailer till the very end. Uh, but then we got, jump into Phase 5. And I would say the... Aside from all the things that were announced, the striking thing to me was how short these phases were a year and a half essentially for phase five and a year and a half for phase six very dissimilar to the multi-year three four year buildup that was phase one two and three that you know phase the first three phases the infinity saga was almost 10 years here the multiverse saga is going to be done in like six years essentially but there's so much more stuff because of the TV shows on those slides. Like yeah. if you think back to the Infinity Saga slides, there at most there were there would be like six things on a slide. Here where we're getting like twelve at points. Like Phase Five alone has what like eleven things on it. Um, it it is a, a ridiculous amount of content, and I actually wonder if this is going to prove to be a huge weakness for the MCU going forward is to have so much just stuff that people just get worn out by it, as opposed to having appointment viewing uh, movies. Well, it's kind of like the, the days of 90s, 90s comic book collecting, yeah. when everything was a tie in and you're like, oh, I can't buy all these big event right. things anymore i gotta skip and just buy my one shots and and buy them in graphic novel form or here in dvd box set form like fatigue fatigue will set in 
and it's gonna be tough to keep up. They have the, the juggling act of having familiarity while and and, and w- with storylines while also introducing new characters and elements, and telling a cohesive, self-contained story is gonna be the storytelling challenge of of Marvel uh, TV going forward and and movies going forward. Um, okay, so we're gonna quickly jump through these because I do want to spend some time on the Black Panther trailer, Secret Invasion, Disney Plus show, big return of Sam Jackson. Amelia Clark, uh, you're going to have Ben Mendelsohn back, Scrolls, and tons of surprises. Espionage yep. type show. Read the comic book. Comic book's great. Tie ins to the comic book are good. Yep. Um, big movie, uh, and the cast was there for this Ant Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania. This is the first film of Phase Five, and I think it's going to set up the big bad. It's going to set up Kang. Right, who we saw at the end of Loki season one, Jonathan Majors, and this is not that same Kang. This is his uh, ancestor, a more evil Kang. They did show a trailer that uh, is not public yet, uh, but from the reports of that trailer, he sounds extremely menacing, and the tone of this movie seems like it's not going to be as lighthearted as the first two Ant Man films. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about Jonathan Majors. I am not terribly excited about Ant Man or the Wasp. Uh, <laughs> what about it, stature? Cassie Lang. They're they're building up for Young Avengers. Give me um, a Modoc. I might be back in. Modoc's in. You got Modoc. Uh, we don't know the casting yet. Although there was, it seems to be from there's the, hints. Yeah, there are hints of who might be playing him in the. Uh, uh, the the footage that was revealed, a familiar actor. I don't know if I like that casting. Um, Garfield as Bodoc, not so great. Uh, okay, um, after Ant Man the Wasp, you have the end of the Guardians of the Galaxy saga trilogy. This is it, the final Guardians of the Galaxy film with a focus on Raccoon, Rocket Raccoon's origins, as well as the reunion of Gamora, who seems to be leading the Ravagers, and Peter Quill. Uh, James Gunn says it's a complete story. It's the end, but not everyone will die. But that also insinuates expect some deaths. Yeah, it seems seems about right. I'm most sad about James Gunn leaving the MCU. Just love him stylistically. High Evolutionary was revealed to be part of this. Was there in person. Yeah. Very strange character. Don't recommend the source material on that. <laughs> um, and then Adam Warlock being one of the uh, big characters there. I don't know how Adam Morlock fits in the MCU now that the Thanos star- storyline is done. Um, and so it'll be interesting how this fits into the larger multiverse saga. This, uh, of all the movies, this feels like the one that I was like, this one's going to be kind of out on its own. I I hope it's not a love triangle between Gamora, Adam Warlock, and Peter Quill. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that would be less interesting. Um, although the, you know, who they cast for Adam Warlock looks the part, he's a golden God. And, um, I, I mean, I, I trust James Gunn's balance of emotional storytelling and high action, uh, TV. We got two TV shows echo. This is the one I'm excited for, but least sure about, cause it's the one where I feel like, does it, did it need to be a show as much as I love the character in the comics, the character of Maya uh, didn't resonate as much in the Hawkeye show. And it's one where I feel like we're, it's got to trust that Kevin Feige and team has a good story they want to tell. Yeah, I mean, so I loved her debut in the Hawkeye show. And then her landing was awful and just totally like it, if it kind of fell apart for me. So, uh, yeah, I think this is the one I'm least hype about. But this is another Daredevil tie in show. Yeah, yeah. Daredevil will be in this. Wilson Fisk will be in this, of course, as the nemesis. Um, and from that, we get to Loki season two, return of Miss Minutes, uh, return of Loki and, and Sylvie. And, well, we don't know much more than that. And I don't know if Kang is going to be in this one either. It will be after Ant Man and the Wasp. So, not sure where they're going to go, but it's uh, Tom Hiddleston back as Loki. Then we got Blade, Blade and Black Knight, potentially. If they make this like a th- real throwback to 90s action movies with with like Highlander feel, I would love that vibe for Blade. But uh, yeah. it's going to be interesting how they insert vampires into the MCU. We'll find out together. 
multiverse, maybe. Um, but they, you know, it's uh, it was announced last time at, they were at Comic Con. It's coming out end of next year. Uh, then we got two TV shows. Um, again, introducing new characters: Ironheart, who is in the Black Panther trailer. This is the successor to uh, to Tony Stark's legacy in uh, Riri Williams. Yeah, I I kind of suspect she is going to be just an absolute star coming out of that Black Panther movie, and this is going to be a massive hit. Um, yeah, again, Young Avengers ing like yep. their version of the Young Avengers, and if she has, if they've, if you know, if they've hit lightning twice with uh, Iman Vellani uh, for Ms. Marvel and get someone as charismatic as that for Ree Williams uh, from the glimpses we saw. It, I mean, it's going to be magic on screen. Uh, Agatha, it's not the House of Harkness. They changed the name to the Coven of Chaos. Again, like Echo, not, not don't know what's where they're going. Don't with need this. this. Love yeah. Catherine Hahn. We'll watch Catherine Hahn in pretty much anything. Don't need this. Yeah. I would say this and Echo. You're right. Are the two that I was like, well, what are we doing here? They're maybe secretly setting up things. Like this is something to to bring back Wanda without announcing a Wanda show. Not sure, but they greenlit it based on the strength of that performance and um, how well she did in WandaVision, and we're not getting a WandaVision season two, so this will be that continuation. What we are getting, though, are 18 episodes of Daredevil in Daredevil Born Again. Yeah, so uh, the title makes you think there's going to be some religious themes, which are common in Daredevil storylines. Announced it's Charlie Cox and Vincent D'Onofrio, who we saw in Hawkeye. They nerfed him a little bit in Hawkeye. I'm hoping they go back to a just full on uh, Kingpin vibes from the original uh, Netflix Daredevil series. You 18 also episodes bring back. is a lot. It's a lot. It's three it's times as many. As the current ones. And I know, you know, there's a formula to the current uh, Disney Plus Marvel shows where you know, build up, build up, build up, fifth episode revelations and backstory, big fight at the end. I'm glad they have the opportunity to tell a longer story, move away from that potentially. Maybe it'll be cheaper to make since it's more of a grounded hero. Um, it is longer than any, you know, big prestige television show we've seen um, to, to roll out in over four months. Oh my God, right? Think about that. It's going to be four months of over four months of Daredevil if it's once a week. They got to bring back Foggy. They got to bring back Karen Page. Those actors were great. And I couldn't imagine a Daredevil show without them. Uh, Born Again, it's, you know, might as well Daredevil rebooted, right? It's rebooted with another name. And then we got uh, last two movies The End of Phase Five, Captain America, New World Order. Sam Wilson is Captain America. No mention of Bucky. Happy to have no Bucky there. Uh, my my wish and hope for this bring back isaiah oh nice that would be interesting if they have isaiah bradley that's a tv show i would watch is a um, patriot yeah a prequel show about isaiah oh, bradley yeah, yeah. I, I would do that as a, a double a prequel flashback yeah. plus modern day with his grandson as the as patriot uh, mm -hmm. in, in the comics well again a young avenger tie-in um and then you got Thunderbolts. So not the Avengers and Phase 5, but it is a culmination and uh, a team movie of sorts. You got to imagine it's Julie Dreyfus. Uh, you got to imagine without Thunderbolt Ross, uh, you can have you know, her as the lead. But U.S. agent, Yelena, um, Baron Zemo, probably. And probably Bucky. Oh, that. Oh, yeah. Okay. And and Ghost, I think, is the other one mm -hmm. that they mentioned from Ant Man and the Wasp. You know, all these minor villains from past MCU shows. You know, if Crossbones was alive, he'd probably be in the show. I have to say, I think these are the two going to be the two worst movies on their slate. Mm. Uh, mm. Unless Cap Four introduces like a a, a vil a, like a big time villain out of nowhere, which I don't think they will because of what's coming in Phase Six. Uh, I just think there won't be anything for these movies to wrestle against and it'll end up being civil war, you know, uh, you know, times two, except sort of like, you know, with lower stakes. There's an opportunity for Thunderbolts to do the, the, like the villains version of the Avengers, right? Like dark Avengers, while you can also still have 
some of the, you know, Shang-Chi, Ant-Man, some of the heroes there in minor cameo roles, and they're kind of evading them um, or, or doing things, you know, behind the scenes. Just don't try to follow a Suicide Squad script. That yeah. would be the death yeah. nail of that. I, of I that. agree. Yeah, what I don't need is you know uh, Julie Dreyfus in a control room on a, on a headset yelling orders at, while they bicker. What is this? Some kind of thunderbolt? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, who would you want? Who who would have to appear in Cap Four to make it resonate with the wider Marvel fan base and Marvel like you know comic fan base? Could they bring back some form of Hydra? Um... Uh, or something. But there's there's no figurehead that makes it exciting, right? Yeah, I don't like, know. I've been struggling with this one too. I really don't know uh, what it could be, and it, they're going to have to set it up soon uh, for yeah. this to really have. Ah, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of like who the who Captain America is the the relationships he had in the comics. I mean, there's like um, those there's. I mean, the original name for Winter Soldier was going to be Serpent Society, so they could go in that direction. That's not that terribly interesting. Um, and so, I, like, I don't know. Like, and they're not going to have it be like U.S. Agent or um, or anything like that because we just had them. Batrock is gone. Crossbones is gone. Um, you know, maybe if Modok appears, they could do something with like AIM. Uh, yeah. <sighs> no, I, I, all these I, suck, I, man. Yeah, <laughs> they do. They do. Uh, they they also didn't announce Armor Wars. So if they collapse those and make this Rhodey and Iron Man and 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 you know Sam Wilson in a high tech suit versus um, people with, uh, out of control Justin Hammer types, uh, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I'm very curious about they were going to go because it's going to have a different. Um, scope than the uh, captain america tv show uh okay phase six only three things announced many more things that come at d23 but it's gonna open with fantastic four still no word on director no world on cast probably saving that for d23 but expected a fantastic four movie uh prior tying to kang maybe that makes some sense right makes a and lot of sense at 2025 is this 20 yeah 2025 we're not getting one, but two Avengers movies if all stays on schedule. First half of the year, we're going to get uh, Avengers, the Kang Dynasty, and just announced today with Daniel uh, D- Dustin Daniel Cretton, who directed Shang-Chi, is directing that. And then you have Avengers Secret Wars at the end of 2025 to wrap up Phase 6. And the We knew summer. we were kind of pushing towards Secret Wars. Um the important thing about Secret Wars is you don't get to have Secret Wars without Doctor Doom, and you—that's right. And so I think that's where we're going. Um, and I, I kind of get uh, this is the part that makes sense. Fantastic Four, Kang, Secret Wars together makes a ton of sense to me. Those three things I can see like the tie-ins together. Um, so the and Black face, Panther with Namor. Yes. Yes, phase six makes sense to me. Phase five does not make a lot of sense to me. Phase five feels like filler until we get there. Uh, unless yeah. I'm, you know, I'm missing something pretty significant. I mean, yeah. Ant-Man and the Wasp uh, accepted because that is a, a Kang setup thing. Yeah, and there's so much like this ground level stuff with Echo, with, you know, perhaps Daredevil and maybe even Ironheart that to, to tie it to the cosmic realm is going to be a little bit of a stretch and secret wars it's basically battle royale with superheroes right i mean in the comics it was beyonder or uh yeah beyonder uh mm-hmm. or molecule man no beyonder you know beyonder. board god power you know just took a board god who took all the superheroes and put them on a planet and made them fight and then spider-man got his venom symbiote like <laughs> that's defined in the 90s and it's uh you can imagine very easily you know uh, storytelling for movies well they can do cg backgrounds all day long if they just put all these actors in a big green screen and have them fight it out yeah but let's get to the best thing um of the entire marvel panel which was the reveal of the black panther trailer and um i'm just gonna back up and say i was expecting them just to get into it 
And this trailer was so emotional from the from the drop of dealing with the ramifications of the real life death of, of Chadwick Boseman. Um, and then setting up a story that emerged from that. Uh, I will uh, start just by saying the music choices alone in how they tied No Woman, No Cry into uh, All Right by Kendrick Lamar just absolutely floored me. This is, I think, the second best Marvel trailer of all time uh, next to uh, Infinity uh, War. Yeah. And part of that, it's not like the situation with Heath Ledger and and Dark Knight where the movie was wrapped. They had a story written and then had to rewrite it and it, in the wake of his death, his passing. And this absolutely leans into as a tribute to him and his legacy and tying his legacy to the Black Panther legacy and, and making it still hopefully be resonant and relevant to, you know, Wakanda and the MCU. Uh, the fact that they're using this also as uh, not only to, to allow fans and the actors to mourn, uh, but also then introduce an antagonist in Namor um, and, and have the themes of empire and, and, um, and these, uh, these hidden empires, you know, clashing against each other, which could, be the foundations for doom as well uh but they're this this unique take on namor you know it's not the greco you know the take on namor it's it's mesoamerica it's it's uh you know mayan um or or i'm not sure if it's aztec or mayan but you know it's it's south american and you had the opening shot with nakia uh on, on the on the on the beach right and in the back you have these temples that are so distinct uh you have these underwater shots you know from the birth of namor with a baby with winged feet. The wings, feet. Right? He's winged mutant. feet. Oh my gosh. I mean, the one shot they have of the actor playing Namor, uh, Huerta, what is his first name? Um, uh, he's played T-Nok. by uh, Tinoch, Tinoch Huerta. Of him close up on his face and just holding his hand up oh. is like, that is Namor. Like, that was great. That, that was, he captured, like, that's Namor, a black bolt right there. Right. <laughs> I- I thought the the two things that stuck out to me, the opening um, or the early kind of funeral celebration where they're wearing all white, which is, you know, obviously many African cultures use use that coloring scheme and um, and just sort of the framing of shots like a koi coming out of the darkness and being sort of uh, uh, framed in the light. And then when the transition to Namor underwater when he turns with the headdress on. Uh, it is incredible, but the most striking thing, and I think the person that a lot of the early movie is going to re- uh, uh, rest on is when Angela Bassett like delivers the that line saying, "You know, I've given my entire family. Have you not taken everything from me?" And just it is like dripping with emotion, um, and it's like, and it, you just hear it as just completely true. And uh, and then you see signs of devastation in, in Wakanda following that. Yeah. Completely sold. This I think this has a chance to like exceed the success of Black Panther if the story actually holds up. Yeah, because yeah. it is that trailer is, you know, basically tells the story of just an exceptional, exceptional uh, movie. Uh, and I hope it delivers on that. I think it'll be just an absolute blockbuster. And so beautifully told. Uh, he, uh, um, Ryan Cooler is a new cinematographer for this, uh, Autumn Durald. And she's bringing elements that remind me of the Eternals uh, and some of the sunset beachside scenes. Uh, there's a the, the throne room with the in flames or covered with water, uh, the underwater cinematography. I mean, James Cameron must be tearing his hair out because this is he's gonna get beat to the punch to for the underwater, you know, an army riding whales um, with with uh, the the Atlanteans here. Uh, and there's that you know the thrilling um, uh, military aspect you know with with the, uh, the, the what looks like a heist scene or an invasion of a, a research base. Um, Plus, you have Iron Heart, a little bit on the nose with hammering out an Iron Heart on the armor, but it's teeing up a bunch of things, uh, and everyone seems to be at the A game. You know, they, they, Winston Duke getting 
clearly uh, a bigger role from all, the, all how great he was uh, in Black Panther and Sense. Um, so that's in Baku. Uh, and yeah, I, we don't know. Like the biggest thing is we don't know how this movie is going to end either. We don't know where where the MCU will be after this. Where Wakanda will be. Uh, we don't know who will be Black Panther at the end of this. This will be. This is a war movie. Um, that starts with a it starts with a funeral and is going to end as a war movie. Um, and uh, I I'm all in on that. I I it, the two big questions for me is Michael B. Jordan going to be in this movie? No, uh, no. I think he will be. What in the ancestral plane? Oh. I think. Uh, and then I think. This will be like a very important post credit movie. I think this is very much like somebody manipulated this war to happen. Doom. It's doom. Yeah. It's doom. It, like I think that's gotta be the reveal <laughs> at the end. I of think this. so too. Yeah. And it's a whole, you know, it's a whole phase away. If this wraps up phase four and Fantastic Four is the beginning of phase six, that is that could be the through line, one of the the uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, the Thanosing uh through throughout um Phase five, I think they tied together. Yeah, lots I, of excitement. I think, unlike Thor: Love and Thunder, which you know built on the success of Ragnarok and it and really kind of fizzled, like especially when you look week over week, I think this has the potential to go the other way, where people are just going to be jam packed to go see this movie, and it has the potential to be like one of those cultural touchstones in addition to being a good movie. Now that's saying a lot. That's putting a lot on this movie from a trailer, but that's what's available now. Oh my gosh. And when is the release date for that? It's November. Soon. That is insane. Wow. Oh my gosh. That's exciting. That's so exciting. Okay. That's all the stuff, all the big news. I'm sure there's so much more other, other things from, from Comic-Con, but that's what we took away. And um, I, I'm just glad that Comic-Con is back. Uh, glad it got the chance to go and we'll be back of course next year and hopefully adam will be as well Uh, before we wrap up two things of note in the vr world Uh, if you are interested and curious about getting an oculus quest 2 this is the week to do it if you can if it's even in stock because uh meta announced today that the price as of august 1st on both the 128 and 256 models are going up by a hundred dollars so it's very strange because Quest 2 launched two years ago, two sep- uh, Septembers, um, for 300 bucks for 64 gigs. They did a mid, mid-product mid upgrade where they bumped the storage up to 128 gigs, and 128 gigs for 300 bucks was an unbelievable deal. The assumption was they were taking a hit or making barely no money on the hardware um, to get adoption up, but... According to them, because of increasing prices uh, and components and the challenges of getting all, this, all the units out, uh, they are pushing the price up as of August, August 1st by 100 bucks. And as we're recording this, you can still go on Best Buy and get a 128 gig Quest 2 for 300 bucks. And you can even get a refurbished, a renewed Quest 2 at 128 gigs for 250 bucks, which is would be unthinkable um, it, a month from now. It's sold out on Amazon. It is. Uh, and... Uh, uh i this is this was probably inevitable given you know all the stuff that's happening uh in in the world i'm very curious um what this does for the pricing that we expect for like cambria and other um uh headsets does this basically lock in 400 is where we're going to be going forward yeah, I mean, I, I think undoubtedly it locks in 400 as a starting points going forward. Yeah. I think they've already said that Cambria is going to be way more, you know, it's, it's like a high end, so north of a thousand. Yeah, but, but the, yeah, the question is you know, to reset this pricing expectation to do it now. What does that mean for a successor to Quest Two? Is that sooner yeah. than we think, or is that confidence on their part of how? popular quest is in that there's price electricity built in where people don't care what price they're happy to pay the extra hundred bucks which i don't think people are it is it's it's so striking that without any hardware upgrade like they could have timed this with the 128 gig um storage improvement but you know to to have it almost out of nowhere is is um is notable um and so there are a couple days left before that price gets changed forever all right that does it that's a big update 
Um, we'll maybe come back next week and talk about ISS. Russian oh my out. god! <laughs> 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 and, and other things that have happened in uh, the science and tech world, <laughs> but uh, that does it for us this week. Uh, sorry for missing last week. And um, as always, you can find us on the YouTube channel. We'll have lots of content coming up. Kishore, anything from you? Any highlights? Any things you want to shout out? It's con season. Get those cosplays done. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Silicon is but a month away in San Jose. So we're going to be there. Um, a lot of friends of Tested are going to be there from Simone Yetch um, to Daryl Maloney, Broken Nerd, uh, Bob, I like to make stuff, uh, and uh, well, also celebrities as well. So, you know, I don't know. I think George Takei, uh, Karen Gillan from Guardians of Galaxy. It's going to be Most there. Most of the Who, of Expanse course. cast. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be a fun time. It's in San Jose uh, Convention Center, and it's our local South Bay convention. So hope to see you there in late August. Uh, but until then, until next week, Thank you so much for joining us. Sure, good to see you. And we'll be back. Uh, there's no Marvel shows on the air. No Star Wars shows in the air. Good. Oh, what am I going to watch? Yeah. We need a, uh, Give we'll me a break. break from that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. See you all next week. Bye.